Welcome to the session on changes to the quality control standards brought about from the release of a firm system of quality control and other amendments to PCOB standards, rules, and forms adopted by the board on May 13th, 2024. The commission approved the PCOB standards, rules, and forms on September 9th, 2024. My name is Lynette Kleindens and I'm an assistant in the office of the chief auditor. I will be joined today by David Ellum and Skylar Sims, also assistants in the office of the chief auditor of the PCOB and we're the project team that worked on the quality control standards. The new quality control standard will lead registered public accounting firms to significantly improve their QC systems. Given the intent of this webinar is to provide an overview, we will not be discussing all the nuances of the standard and related amendments. As a result, I encourage participants to read the adopting release I mentioned earlier in order to gain a more complete understanding of the new standard and related amendments. Before we get started, I'll state our standard disclaimer. The views expressed are offered in our capacity as staff of the PCOB's Office of the Chief Auditor, but they are our own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the board as a whole, any individual board members, or other PCOB staff. We will start the session with providing an overview of QC1000, discussing its applicability, objective, and provide a brief overview of components. David will then discuss the roles and responsibilities in a firm's QC system, and then the firm's risk assessment process. Then I will walk us through the components that address the firm's organization and operations. Sky will then provide information regarding the monitoring and remediation process, and we will wrap this session up with the evaluation and reporting and documentation requirements. The board adopted a number of changes to the board's standards, rules, and forms. QC1000 is a new standard that supersedes QC standards that were developed decades ago and issued by the AICPA before the PCOB was established. That is QC20, QC30, and QC40. QC1000 also supersedes the SCC practice section, known as SCCPS, requirements. QC1000 requires a rigorous annual evaluation of the firm's QC system and related reporting to the PCOB. Firms are able to submit this form under the existing RASR system. In connection with the adoption of QC1000, the board adopted other changes to its standards, rules, and forms. These include, among other changes, expanding the auditor's responsibility to respond to deficiencies on completed engagements under an amended and retitled AS2901 titled Responding to Engagement Deficiencies after issuance of the auditor's report. It also replaced the board's existing standard ET102, Integrity and Objectivity, with a new standard EI1000, Integrity and Objectivity, to better align the board's ethics requirements with the scope, approach, and terminology of QC1000. Let's take a closer look at the QC1000 timeline. QC1000 was adopted by the board in May 2024 and approved by the SEC in September 2024. The new standard and related amendments will become effective on December 15th, 2025. This mean that means that a firm's QC system needs to be designed by December 15th, 2025, and a firm will need to be ready to start implementing and operating it from the date onwards in accordance with QC 1000. The firm's first evaluation date will be as of September 30th, 2026, with the first filing of the form QC, which we will discuss later, by November 30th, 2026 changed from QC 20, 30, and 40, and the SECPS requirements, there is an emphasis on accountability, firm culture, and the tone at the top, and firm governance through requirements for specified roles within and responsibilities for the QC system, including at the highest level of the levels of the firm, quality objectives that link compensation to quality, and for the largest firms, the requirement for an independent perspective on firm governance referred to as the external QC function or EQCF. QC1000 includes a new risk-based approach, which should drive firms to proactively identify and manage the risks associated with their practice. 
a set of mandates, including required risk assessment, specified quality objectives, and specified quality responses, which should assure that the QC system is designed, implemented, and operated with an appropriate level of rigor. There are new requirements that address changes in the audit practice environment, including the increasing participation of other firms and other outside resources, the role of firm networks, and the evolving use of technology and other resources, and the increasing importance of internal and external firm communications. QC1000 also includes broader responsibilities for monitoring and remediation of deficiencies to encourage an ongoing feedback loop that drives continuous improvement. And there is a rigorous annual evaluation of the firm's QC system and related reporting to the PC certified by key personnel to underscore the importance of the annual evaluation of the QC system, reinforce individual accountability, and support ECOB oversight. Let's take a look at applicability of QC1000 and who is affected. All firms that are registered with the board, including those that do not audit issuers or SEC registered brokers and dealers, or perform substantial role engagements, are affected in new QC1000, but not all requirements of QC1000 apply to every firm. All registered firms are required to design a QC system that complies with QC1000. Firms that perform or have responsibilities with respect to engagements under PCOB standards are required to implement and operate their QC system. Engagement is a defined term under QC1000 in paragraph A3 of Appendix A. It is defined as any audit, attestation, review, or other engagement performed under PCOB standards led by a firm or in which a firm plays a substantial role in the preparation or furnishing of an audit report as defined in PCAOB rules. Let's unpack the applicability. Under QC1000, firms that do not have responsibilities with respect to engagements are only required to design a QC system that meets the requirements of QC1000. This is referred to as scaled applicability. At all times that a firm is required to comply with applicable professional and legal requirements, with respect to any of the firm's engagements, the firm is required to design, implement, and operate an effective QC system. That is, comply with all the requirements of QC1000. This is referred to as full applicability. QC1000 defines applicable professional and legal requirements in paragraph A2 of Appendix A, also called APLR, to include professional standards as defined by the PCOB, and rules of the PCOB that are not professional standards. It also includes, to the extent related to the obligations and responsibilities of accountants or auditors in the context of engagements or in relation to the QC system, rules of the SEC, other provisions of US federal securities laws, ethics laws and regulations, and other applicable statutory, regulatory, and other legal requirements. To provide some clarity regarding parts of the APLR definition, an example of a rule of the PCOB that is not a professional standard is PCAOB Rule 2200, titled Annual Report, which requires a firm to file an annual report on Form 2. An example of ethics laws and regulations include ethics laws under jurisdictions that accountants are subject to. This does not include, for example, the AICPA's Code of Conduct. However, we recognize that many states adopt the AICPA Code of Conduct as part of their ethics laws. The graphic presented on this slide illustrates the determination as to whether a firm is subject to scaled or full applicability. For reference, this graphic can be found in the scalability section of the adopting release on page 62. A firm that is not currently performing any engagements may nevertheless have to comply with APLR, with respect to a previous or future firm engagement. An example of APLR related to past engagements is documentation retention requirements addressed in AS 1215 titled audit documentation. Even if the firm is not currently performing any engagements, it may have a documentation retention obligation, and this obligation will make the firm subject to APLR and subject to full applicability. 
Other examples of APLR related to past engagements include if the issuer requests the auditor's consent to include its report in a registration statement, or an engagement deficiency is identified that requires remediation, or the auditor becomes aware of facts that may have existed at the date of the auditor's report, which may have affected the report. An example of APLR related to future engagements is procedures for the acceptance of a new engagement. They have to be performed before the engagement is conducted. For example, considering whether the firm is independent and whether the services are permissible. A firm that is subject to scaled applicability is required to design QC system under QC 1000. A firm that is subject to full applicability is required to design, implement, and operate its QC system under QC 1000. The implementation and operation of the QC system is commensurate with the APLR. For example, if a firm last performed an engagement five or six years ago and has no current responsibilities with respect to any other firm's engagements, it might be subject only to requirements regarding the retention of certain engagement-related documentation. In such a circumstance, an effective QC system, that is, a system that provides reasonable assurance that the firm is complying with applicable professional and legal requirements regarding such documentation, could be scaled back to address only engagement-related documentation retention, as well as ongoing evaluation, reporting, and documentation requirements with respect to the QC system itself. Nonetheless, all registered firms are affected by QC 1000. What does it mean to design QC system if the firm is subject to scaled applicability? QC 1000 includes specific requirements in paragraph six. Firms are required to assign QC related roles and responsibilities, establish quality objectives, annually identify and assess quality risks to the achievement of those quality objectives, and design quality responses to address those quality risks. I'm going to take a moment to unpack this requirement. First, Appendix A of QC 1000 provides definitions of quality objectives, quality of risk, and quality of responses. We will briefly mention these definitions again later in the presentation when we talk about the firm's risk assessment process. Next, the design of the QC system based on the quality of risks the firm likely would face if it performed engagements, taking into account the size and complexity of the firm. For example, if a firm is contemplating performing an engagement in a specific industry, a quality risk could be not having enough competent resources to perform an engagement in that industry in accordance with APLR and the firm's, firm's policies and procedures. Another quality risk a firm could identify is not having sufficient and appropriate knowledge about the SEC's independence requirements that a firm would be subject to once it starts performing PCOB engagements. Another important point to make with respect to this requirement is that a firm under scaled applicability is required to design quality responses, but is not required to implement and operate them until it can be become subject to full applicability. Firms under scale applicability are required to design a monitoring and remediation process that, upon implementation, would comply with QC 1000 requirements, and finally, required to document the design of the QC system. A firm may not have a lot of advance notice when transitioning from scale to full applicability. For example, this may be due to an affiliated firm reaching out to ask the firm to play a substantial role in one of their engagements. Under this scenario, a firm would need to implement the acceptance and continuance of engagement requirements that were designed for their QC system. Firms will have to stand ready with a designed QC system that can be implemented and operated over such responsibilities whenever they arise. This is why it is important to have a designed QC system. Once a firm no longer has any responsibilities under APLR with respect to any firm engagements, the firm is required to continue operating the QC system until the next September 30th, which is the next evaluation date. This ensures that the firm will evaluate and report on the QC system for any year during which the QC system was required to operate. Firms that are not required to implement and operate a QC system at any time within the previous 12 months, set another way from the last annual evaluation date of September 30th, would not be subject to the requirement to evaluate and report on their QC system. 
Now that we have covered applicability of QC1000, let's ground ourselves in what the objective of a firm's QC system is under QC1000. QC1000 specifies that an effective QC system provides a firm with reasonable assurance that the firm, each member of firm personnel, and each other participant conduct each of the firm's engagement and fulfill their other responsibilities that are part of or subject to the firm's QC system in accordance with APLR. And each engagement report is issued by the firm that is issued by the firm is in accordance with APLR. This is referred to as the reasonable assurance objective. We are going to dissect some of the terms used in the reasonable assurance objective to better understand the scope of the standard. The concept of reasonable assurance is consistent with QC20, which is the board's quality control standards currently in place until QC1000 becomes effective on December 15th, 2025. For example, under Q, a QC system is a process to provide a firm with reasonable assurance that its personnel comply with applicable professional standards and the firm's standards of quality. In the context of engagement performance, QC20 also required the firm to required, required the system of quality control to provide reasonable assurance that the work performed meets applicable regulatory requirements. However, QC1000 goes further and extends the reasonable assurance objective to cover not just the firm and its personnel, but also other participants. Before we move on to the next slide to discuss the defined terms of firm personnel and other participants, I'd like to emphasize again that under QC1000, a firm's QC system operates not just over firm personnel, but also over the firm's use of other participants. Here is a graphical depiction of the definition of firm personnel from the adopting release, which can be found on page 51. The definition can be found in paragraph A5 of Appendix A of QC1000. Firm personnel are individual proprietors, partners, shareholders, members or other principals, accountants, and professional staff of a registered public accounting firm. Responsibilities include assisting with the performance of the firm's engagements, or the design, implementation, or operation of the firm's QC system, including engagement quality reviews. Professional staff includes employees as well as individuals, such as non-employee contractors and consultants who work under the firm's supervision or direction and can control and function as the firm's employees. These individuals include, for example, secondees and lease staff who work under the supervision or direction and control of the firm. Professional staff does not include persons engaged only in clerical or ministerial tasks. Some examples of firm personnel include an engagement quality reviewer who is an employee or a partner of the firm, personnel at a shared service center where the structure is such that the service, shared service center is part of the firm, secondees and lease staff under the supervision and control of the firm, or specialists employed by the firm. Here is a graphical depiction of the definition of other participants from the adopting release, which can be found on page 51. The definition can be found in paragraph A7 in Appendix A of QC1000. Other participants are, with respect to the work performed in connection with the firm's QC system or the performance of its, of its engagements, other participants are accounting firms, foreign or domestic, registered or unregistered, accountants and other professionals or organizations other than firm personnel. Whose responsibilities include assisting with the performance of the firm's engagements or the design, implementation or operation of the firm's QC system, including engagement quality reviews. Some examples include work personnel, other auditors, engagement quality reviewer from outside the firm, such as a consultant, personnel from a shared service center that is within the network of a firm but is a separate entity, the external QC function or the EQCF, or a specialist engaged by the firm. The persons performing some roles, such as an engagement quality reviewer or personnel at shared service centers, may be either firm personnel or other participants, depending on their relationship to the firm. For example, an engagement quality reviewer employed by the firm would be considered firm personnel whereas one that has been contracted from outside the firm that is not functioning as a firm employee would be another participant. Similarly, personnel at a shared service center may be firm personnel if they are employed by the firm or function as a firm employee, 
or other participant if they are employed by other organization, such as a network affiliate. If a person does not meet the definition of firm personnel, then the person could meet the definition of other participants depending on their relationship to the firm. QC1000 references firm personnel and other participants throughout the standard. The firm would need to understand how other participants fit in their QC system and engagements and what specific quality risks could be identified and develop responses to address these quality risks. Next, we'll introduce the components of a firm's QC system under QC1000. QC1000 describes eight integrated components that are required to be included in a firm's system in a firm's design of its QC system. These components are consistent with other quality management standards. Throughout this session, we will revisit this graphic to point out where we are in the QC system. The two process components are the firm's risk assessment process, referred to as FRAP, and the monitoring and remediation process, referred to as MNR. QC1000 requires full applicability firms to design, implement, and operate a QC system that reflects and responds to the firm's particular risks through these two process components. Again, that is the firm's risk assessment process and the monitoring and remediation process such, in such a way that it's carried out, that is informed by and responsive to the risks. The other six components are non-process components that address aspects of the firm's organization and operations. They are governance and leadership, ethics and independence, acceptance and continuance of engagements, engagement performance, resources, and information and communication. FRAP is the process the firm is required to follow in implementing the risk-based approach. And on the graphic, we can see it wraps around the components related to the firm's organization and operations. MNR is the process that provides the firm with relevant, reliable, and timely information about the design, implementation, and operation of QC1000. We can see this also wraps around the other components as is part of the feedback with FRAP. Also, MNR produces information that is used by a firm when performing its evaluation and reporting on the effectiveness of its QC system. Although the evaluation reporting is not a component, the firm is required to annually evaluate the effectiveness of the QC system and report to the PCOB on the system evaluation. The standard also includes requirements that address individual roles and responsibilities in the QC system and documentation of the QC system. These requirements are not depicted on the graphic. I will now turn to David to go over roles and responsibility requirements of QC1000. Thanks, Lynette. Yes, next I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing the roles and responsibilities that QC1000 requires the firm to have in its organizational structure. The standard requires firms to assign responsibilities for a few different roles which are shown on this slide. The firm is also required to establish a direct line of communication from each individual assigned operational responsibilities, that is the bottom three roles shown on the slide in the red, green and gray boxes, to the individual assigned ultimate responsibility and accountability for the QC system as a whole, the role shown on the top of the slide in a blue box. I'm gonna point out a few specifics of each of these roles next, but first, I want to highlight an important point, which is that the individuals with ultimate responsibility and accountability for the QC system as a whole and operational responsibility and accountability for the QC system as a whole which are highlighted with stars on the left-hand side of the slide, are required to certify the firm's evaluation of its QC system on form QC. I'm gonna explain what that is a little later, but this was a point that I wanted to make sure to highlight. I also want to point out that the individuals that fill the roles required by QC1000 are required to be firm personnel. While these individuals may have other participants assisting with their responsibilities, such as individuals in the firm's network or consultants external to the firm, firm personnel are required to fill these roles and bear the responsibility and accountability, if applicable, that comes with the role. Let's go through a few important points about the individual with ultimate responsibility and accountability for the QC system as a whole. First, the firm's principal executive officer is ultimately responsible and accountable for the QC system as a whole. This is the firm's highest ranking executive, regardless of formal title. 
Second, if a firm has co-principal executive officers, each of them is ultimately responsible and accountable for the QC system as a whole. Finally, the standard doesn't include any specific criteria required by individuals to serve in this role, such as competencies or credentials, beyond that they certify the firm's evaluation of its QC system on Form QC, as I just mentioned. Next, I want to make a few overarching points about the other roles required by QC 1000. That is the individual with operational responsibility and accountability for the QC system as a whole, the individual with operational responsibility for the firm's compliance with ethics and independence requirements, and the individual with operational responsibility for the monitoring and remediation process. First, the firm personnel fulfilling these roles are required to have the experience, competence, authority, and time needed to enable them to carry out their assigned responsibilities. More information about the specific requirements for each of these roles can be found in paragraphs 15 through 17 of QC 1000 and in the related adopting release. Second, only one individual may be assigned responsibility for each role. However, a firm may assign an individual to more than one of the roles. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Finally, if it's appropriate based on the nature and circumstances of the firm, the firm should assign operational responsibility for other components of the QC system. This requirement, which is in paragraph 12D of QC 1000, is intended to provide firms with the ability to assign additional roles with operational responsibility for other components within the firm's QC system based on the nature and circumstances of the firm. For example, a larger or more complex firm might assign an, an individual with operational responsibility over the firm's resources component. Let's go over a couple of stipulations regarding assigning individuals to these roles. Depending on the nature and circumstances of the firm and its engagements, the firm may assign one individual to more than one of the QC system oversight roles. For example, in a smaller or less complex firm, the individual with ultimate responsibility and accountability for the QC system as a whole may be the same person that is assigned operational responsibility and accountability for the QC system as a whole. In a particularly small firm, that individual may also be assigned other operational responsibilities, such as for ethics and independence and or monitoring and remediation. However, a firm cannot split responsibility of any of the three roles with operational responsibility. What a firm can do is structure its organization so that a single individual with operational responsibility is supported by multiple individuals. Also, some firms might seek assistance from their network or other participants in performing some of their monitoring activities. Nevertheless, a single individual within the firm is required to remain responsible the operational responsibilities of the assigned roles. Finally, a reminder of what I mentioned earlier in this section. If a firm has co-principal executive officers, each of them is ultimately responsible and accountable for the QC system as a whole. Said another way, more than one individual is permitted to have ultimate responsibility and accountability for the QC system as a whole. In addition to the roles and responsibilities that all firms are required to assign, firms with larger PCOV audit practices are required to incorporate another role for the firm's QC system into their governance structure. This role is called an external QC function or EQCF. This requirement is included within the governance and leadership section of the standard in paragraph 28 of QC 1000. Let's spend a little bit more time understanding the composition of the EQCF the EQCF responsibilities, qualifications and skill set of the EQCF, and related ethics and independence considerations. First, QC 1000 requires the EQCF role to be comprised of one or more persons who are not partners, shareholders, members, other principals, or employees of the firm, and do not otherwise have a commercial, familial, or other relationship with the firm that would interfere with the exercise of independent judgment with regard to matters related to the QC system. The EQCF can be composed of one person, while the firm may determine based on its circumstances 
the modeling of how SNS needed to appropriately carry out the function. For example, a firm might conclude that multiple individuals are needed to be part of the EQCR in order for the EQCR to have the specific skill set the firm determines are necessary to carry out the requirements of the function. In that regard, firms may conclude that one or more persons appointed to the EQCR should, should be non-auditors to bring greater diversity of perspectives to the function. QC1000 requires the EQCF's responsibilities to include, at a minimum, evaluating the significant judgments made and the related conclusions reached by the firm when evaluating and reporting on the effectiveness of this QC system. There is no requirement for the EQCF to reassess the firm's judgments and conclusions. The EQCF evaluates the work performed by others, but it does not redo that work. There is also no requirement for the EQCF to provide concurring approval with respect to the firm's conclusions. Both firms could choose to require that as a matter of policy. The EQCS mandated responsibility does not extend to all of the firm's QC-related judgments and conclusions, but only to significant ones made in connection with the firm's annual QC system evaluation and reporting. QC1000 does not otherwise prescribe the role of the EQCF, which provides firms with substantial flexibility. Firms may design, designate a range of different responsibilities for the EQCF depending on their circumstances and needs. A firm can expand the responsibilities of the EQCF if and as it determines necessary based on the facts and circumstances of the firm as a quality response to one or more quality risks identified by the firm or to enable more effective oversight of the QC system as a whole. One last point to mention on responsibilities. Like all persons performing QC functions in the QC1000, those in the EQCF role would be required to exercise due professional care in performing their responsibilities. For qualifications and skill sets, the EQCF is required to have the experience, competence, authority, and time necessary to enable them to carry out their assigned responsibilities. QC1000 does not mandate any other qualifications or skill sets a firm's EQCF should possess. The firm makes this determination based on its specific facts and circumstances, including the qualifications and skill sets needed for the EQCF to execute additional responsibilities that firms assign to it, if any. Now let's talk about ethics and independence considerations. PCOB ethics and independence rules are applicable to public accounting firms and their associated persons. The definition of associated person includes independent contractors, among others, that receive compensation from the firm or participate in any activity of that firm. Because individuals serving in an EQCF role cannot be partners, shareholders, members, other principals, or employees of the firm, the board has said that it expects that such individuals would be engaged as independent contractors, and therefore believes that an individual who serves in an EQCF role will meet the definition of an associated person. Therefore, PCOB, AOB, ethics, and independence roles will generally be applicable to individuals serving in an EQCF role, as will other laws, rules, or standards applicable to them that the PCAOB is responsible for enforcing. However, individuals who serve in an EQCF role may not be subject to the SEC rule on auditor independence. They could be, but are not required to be in the chain of command for purposes of that rule. Individuals who are considered to be in chain of command would be covered persons and therefore subject to the SEC independence role. Firms may choose to require the EQCF to comply with the SEC independence requirements as a matter of policy. Now that we've gone over roles and responsibilities within a firm's QC system, Let's move on to discuss the first step in designing an effective QC system, which is the firm's risk assessment process. The firm's risk assessment process is one of the two process components of a firm's QC system. As a reminder, the other one is monitoring and remediation, which we'll cover later in greater detail. The firm's risk assessment process applies to the six components that address aspects of the firm's organization and operations, which are circled on this slide. Again, they are governance and leadership, ethics and independence, acceptance and continuance of engagements, engagement performance, resources, and information and communication. The firm's risk assessment process is the basis for a risk-based approach to the design, implementation, and operation of the firm's QC system. 
In combination with the monitoring and remediation process, it creates a feedback loop to drive continuous improvement of the firm's QC system. The process consists of establishing quality objectives, identifying and assessing quality risks to the achievement of the quality objectives, and designing and implementing quality responses to address those quality risks. We'll briefly go over each of these on the next slides. But before we move on, I'd like to emphasize that under QC1000, firms are required to identify and assess quality risks annually. QC1000 requires firms to establish quality objectives, which is a defined term in paragraph A10 of Appendix A of QC1000. Establishing quality objectives is the first step in the risk assessment process and forms the basis for the identification and assessment of quality risks and the design and implementation of quality responses. The standard defines quality objectives as the desired outcomes in relation to the components of the QC system to be achieved by the firm. The quality objectives are specified in QC1000 for each of the six components that address aspects of the firm's organization and operations. Again, going back to our graphic of the structure of the firm's QC system, these components are circled. Each of these components has a list of quality objectives specified in the standard. In addition to the quality objectives required by the standard, the firm is required to establish any other quality objectives it determines to be necessary to achieve the, call, the reasonable assurance objective. The requirement for the firm to establish quality objectives necessary to achieve the reasonable assurance objective is designed to prompt ongoing re-examination of the quality objectives and modification as needed, which should enable the firm's QC system to adapt to a changing environment and remain fit for purpose. If a firm determines that its quality objectives need to be more specific, it could establish sub-objectives to provide a more direct link to quality risks and support the development of more comprehensive or better targeted responses. Annually, firms are required to identify and assess the quality risks to achieving each of its quality objectives. The standard defines quality risks in paragraph a12 of Appendix A as risks, whether or not related to intentional acts by firm personnel or other participants to deceive or to violate APLR, that individually or in combination with other risks have a reasonable possibility of occurring and a reasonable possibility of adversely affecting the firm's achievement of one or more quality objectives if they do occur. Under QC1000, firms are required to identify and assess quality risks for each established quality objective. Unlike quality objectives, which are specified by QC1000, quality risks are not specified in the standard. Instead, firms are required to identify their unique quality risks based on their own facts and circumstances. Quality risks should be specific to the firm and the engagements it performs. Identifying quality risks as an inverse of the quality objective, that is, the identified quality risk is that the quality objective will not be met, generally would not be specific to a firm and its engagements, and may result in a firm designing quality responses that are not effective in achieving the quality objective. Also, firms should exercise caution when using third-party issued risk assessment templates because the examples of quality risks provided in the template may not be specific enough or reflect the firm's circumstances and the nature of its engagements and may result in a firm designing quality responses that are not effective in addressing the quality risk and achieving the quality objective. The standard requires a firm to obtain an understanding of the conditions, events and activities that may adversely affect the, the achievement of the firm's quality objectives. This understanding underpins the firm's identification and assessment of the quality risks that are most relevant to the achievement of the firm's quality objectives. Let's spend a little bit more time on this requirement. QC1000 requires the firm as part of identifying and assessing quality risks to first obtain an understanding of the conditions, events, and activities that may adversely affect the achievement of the firm's quality objectives. This includes understanding the nature and circumstances of the firm and of the firm's engagements, 
and any other relevant information, including information from the firm's monitoring and remediation activities, external inspections or reviews, and other oversight activities by regulators. The firm then identifies and assesses quality risks by taking this information into account, as well as, well as whether, how, and the degree to which the achievement of the quality objectives may be adversely affected. Know that the assessment of quality risks is based on inherent risk without regard to the effect of any related quality responses. The assessment is similar to the determination made under AS2201 as to whether an account or disclosure is significant based on inherent risk without regard to the effect of controls. Appendix B of the standard provides examples of considerations related to the nature and circumstances of the firm and its engagements that may give rise to quality risks. Specific examples in Appendix B are meant to be illustrative rather than a checklist for every firm to consider. Utilizing examples of considerations from Appendix B will help firms to identify quality risks that are specific to the firm and the engagements it performs. Again, I'd like to emphasize, the quality risks should be specific to the firm and the engagements it performs. I'm going to provide an example from Appendix B on the next slide. One example of the nature and circumstances of the firm relates to its complexity and operating characteristics, which is discussed in B2 of Appendix B. An example relevant to that is changes in firm structure, which is addressed in subparagraph D of B2. This may be relevant for a firm that has recently completed an acquisition of another firm. This consideration may result in the identification of a number of quality, object, quality risks, such as a quality risk that the audit methodology used by the acquired firm may not be compatible with the acquirer's methodology, or a quality risk that the firm is unable to retain personnel post-acquisition, which may pose risks related to quality objectives in areas like engagement performance and resources. The adopting release on page 105 provides a graphic that illustrates the process of identifying and assessing quality risks. A couple of points to emphasize here. First, firms are not required to identify every conceivable risk, but only those that have a reasonable possibility of occurring, and if they were to occur, a reasonable possibility of adversely affecting the firm's achievement of one or more quality objectives. Second, the identification of quality risks takes into account individual risks, as well as combinations of risks. For example, a risk that has a reasonable possibility of occurring, but individually does not have a reasonable possibility of adversely affecting the achievements of the quality objective, may meet the definition of a quality, quality risk when analyzed in combination with other risks. Okay, coming back to our original graphic. Once the firm identifies and assesses its quality risks, it is required to design and implement quality responses to those quality risks. Quality responses are policies and procedures designed and implemented by the firm to address quality risks. Let's spend more time on this requirement. QC1000 requires a firm to design and implement quality responses that one, are based on the quality risks and reasons for the assessments given to the quality risks, and two, reduce to an appropriately low level the risk that the quality objective will not be achieved. A quality response may address a single quality risk or multiple quality risks related to one or more components of the firm's QC system. In addition to the quality responses that firms design on their own through the risk assessment process, QC1000 also includes specified quality responses. Specified quality responses are specific policies and procedures that relate to risks that apply to all the firms to which they apply. In some cases, all firms, and in other cases, only firms with larger PCOB audit practices. QC1000 includes specified quality responses for each component except for engagement performance and the pro process components, i.e. firms risk assessment process and the monitoring and remediation process. Because specified quality responses are a subset of quality responses, while they may address multiple quality risks within multiple components of the firm's QC system, they are not intended to be comprehensive and alone will not be sufficient to enable a firm to achieve all established quality objectives of the firm's QC system. Said another way, specified quality responses 
do not represent the minimum set of quality responses a firm is required to design, implement, and operate in order to meet the reasonable assurance objective. The firm is required to design and implement their own quality responses in addition to the specified quality responses required by the standard. Some specified quality responses are applicable to all firms, and some are applicable only to firms that issued audit reports with respect to more than 100 issuers during the prior calendar year, referred to in this webinar as firms with larger PCOB audit practices. Okay, let's, let's come back to our initial graphic one more time. Firms are required to take proactive measures to address new quality risks that may come up between the firm's periodic risk assessments by modifying its quality objectives, quality risks, and quality responses as necessary. To the extent practical, the firm's policies and procedures would not just be retrospective, but also forward-looking, so the firm could anticipate and plan for significant changes. Policies and procedures related to the modification of quality objectives, quality risks, and quality responses might vary depending on the size and complexity of the firm and the types and variety of engagements it performs. For a larger firm, operating in a complex environment with a wide range of engagements in different industries, such policies and procedures could be extensive. For example, they could involve periodic meetings with teams across the firm to gather and analyze the necessary information to enable the firm to identify changes to conditions, events, and activities that may require modification of the firm's quality objectives, quality risks, or quality responses. Smaller and, and less complex firms operating a, in a less varied and, and more stable environment may have a less extensive set of policies and procedures for determining when modifications are needed. Next, I'll point out a few remaining key points related to the firm's risk assessment process before we move on. First, the risk assessment process is iterative and ongoing so that new or developing risks are identified and addressed as they emerge. Firms do not necessarily need to address the requirements of the risk assessment process in a linear manner. For example, in identifying and assessing quality risks, the firm may determine that one or more additional quality objectives are required. Or in designing and implementing quality responses, the firm may identify additional quality risks. Also, the requirements regarding the risk assessment process generally apply only to work performed under PCOB standards. However, a firm is, of course, permitted to design, implement, and operate a single risk assessment process for its entire audit and assurance practice that satisfies both QC1000 and the other quality control standards that apply to it. Finally, there are a number of ways to approach the design and implementation of the risk assessment process. When considering how to meet these general requirements of the firm's risk assessment process, firms may wish to consider who might be involved in the process and, and how often to enable a proactive and effective process that is responsive to changing circumstances. For smaller and less complex firms, the risk assessment process may be centralized and involve only a few individuals and less frequent meetings. For larger and more complex firms, the risk assessment process may be more structured and decentralized, involving multiple layers and groups and having periodic meetings to analyze the necessary information that may require modification of the firm's quality objectives, quality risks, or quality responses. Next, I'll turn back to Lynette, who's gonna discuss the QC system components that address the firm's organization and operations. Thanks, David. Now let's briefly discuss the QC components that address the organization and operations. As a reminder, let's go back and see where we are on the structure of the firm's QC system as described in QC1000. So far, we have discussed the first of the two process components, that is the firm's risk assessment process. QC system components that address the firm's organization and operation are the next six components on the list. These are what we, are, we will briefly talk about next. The governance and leadership component addresses the environment that enables the effective oversight and operation of the QC system and directs the firm's culture, decision-making processes, organizational structure, and leadership. Under QC 1000, a firm is required to establish quality objectives for the governance and leadership component in several different areas. They include the firm's commitment to quality, organization and governance structure, 
and resources. This component includes spe specified quality responses that are applicable to all firms and two applicable to only firms with larger PCAOB audit practices. When we talk about those with larger PCAOB audit practices, we mean those firms that issued reports with respect to more than 100 in the calendar year. Those applicable to all firms require them to establish clear lines of responsibility and supervision and policies and procedures related to complaints and allegations. One of the specified quality responses applicable to firms with larger PCOB audit practices is to provide a confidential and anonymous process for submitting complaints and allegations. Another specified quality response applicable to firms with larger PCOB audit practices is that the firm, the firm incorporates an external QC function in the firm's governance structure. The EQCF function should be comprised of one or more persons who are not partners, shareholders, members, other principals or employees of the firm and do not otherwise have a commercial, familiar, familial, or other relationship with the firm that would interfere with the exercise of independent judgment with regard to matters related to the QC system. We briefly mentioned EQCF role when we talked earlier about roles and responsibilities. The ethics and independence component addresses the fulfillment of the firm and individual responsibilities under ethics and independence requirements. This component tailored to the ethics and independence requirements that apply to engagements performed under PCAOB standards. Ethics and independence requirements include the PCAOB's ethics and independence standards and rules, the SEC's rule on auditor independence, and other applicable requirements regarding accountant ethics and independence that are relevant to fulfilling their obligations and responsibilities in conduct of engagements or in relation to the QC system, such as those arising under state law or the law of other jurisdictions. For example, obligations regarding client confidentiality. This component includes quality objectives in the areas of ethics and independence requirements are understood and complied with, violations are properly identified, evaluated, and responded to, violations are communicated appropriately. This component in classified quality responses that are applicable to all firms and one that is applicable to only firms with larger PCAOB audit practices. There are several specified quality responses applicable to all firms and require firms to design, implement, and maintain policies and procedures related to general ethics and independence matters, certain matters that may reasonably be thought to bear on independence, communication regarding ethics and independence policies and procedures, and mandatory training in, on ethics and independence. The specified quality response applicable to firms with larger PCAOB audit practices is to automate the process to identify restricted investments. This specified quality response is based on an existing SECPS requirement. That is, firms that provide an annual audit to more than 500 SEC registrants are already required to have an automated system to identify investment holdings of partners and managers that might impair the continuance of engagements component addresses the firm's process for making decisions about whether to accept or continue engagement. This component includes quality objectives in two areas. The first relates to judgments about whether to accept or continue an engagement. The second is about the terms of the engagement. This component includes one specified quality applicable to all firms and none that are applicable to only firms with larger PCAOB audit practices. The one applicable to all firms is policies and procedures to address when information is obtained subsequent to accepting or engagement. The engagement performance component addresses the firm's processes related to the performance of the firm's engagements by firm personnel and other participants in accordance with APLR. In, other, in, in other words, it encompasses the activities of firm personnel and other participants in all phases of the design and execution of the engagement, including planning, performing, supervising, and documenting the engagement, conducting an engagement quality review, and making communications regarding the engagement. One can think of this component as representing the quality control system over the performance standards that relate to the execution of engagement. This component includes quality objectives in four areas. Those are responsibilities are understood and fulfilled by firm personnel and other participants. 
Consultations on complex, unusual, or unfamiliar accounting and auditing matters are undertaken. Differences in professional judgment are brought to attention of the individuals with responsibility and authority for resolving such matters. And engagement to do documentation is prepared, reviewed, assembled, and retained in accordance with APLR. QC1000 does not include specified quality responses related to the engagement performance component of a firm's system of quality control. Nevertheless, the firm is still required to identify and assess quality risks and design and implement quality responses that address quality risks. The resources component addresses the firm's processes for obtaining, developing, using, maintaining, allocating, and assigning the firm's resources to enable the design, implementation, and operate of the firm's QC system and the performance of its engagements. The firm's resources include people, financial, technological, and intellectual resources, and resources from a network or third-party provider. This component number of quality objectives that relate to five areas. Those are firm personnel, including their compliance with the firm policy and procedures, assignment of people resources, both technological and intellectual resources. Technological resources generally include information technology applications, infrastructure, and processes. Intellectual resource examples include the firm's policies and procedures, methodologies, guides, practice aids, and standardized documentation templates. Network or third-party resources, which we will discuss on the next one. This component includes specified quality responses that are applicable to all firms and none that are applicable to only firms with larger PCAOB audit practices. The specified quality responses in this component include firm personnel adhering to appropriate standards of conduct, also engagement partners and other firm personnel obtaining and maintaining their competencies, including mandatory training requirements in the firm and firm personnel licensure. The firm's periodic evaluation should take into account the outcome of the evaluation of the QC system for the individuals with the ultimate and operational responsibility for the QC system as a whole. And lastly, the firm's technological resources should have certain characteristics to enable their operation. Now let's talk a bit more about the resources from network and third-party providers. Many firms belong to a regional, national, or global network of firms. And networks may involve a wide variety of arrangements and different degrees of coordination and cooperation across firms. Rather than defining the term network, QC1000 describes these types of arrangements in more general terms. Networks of firms may be structured in a variety of ways and include arrangements between firms for sharing knowledge, developing and implementing consistent policies, tools, and methodologies, conducting multi-location engagements, or executing other types of business or administrative matters. The resources component references the term third-party provider, which is a defined term in paragraph A13 of Q1000. Third-party providers are individuals or organizations other than other participants that provide resources or services to the firm that are designed specifically for use in the performance of the engagements, such as purchase methodologies, related templates, and IT applications, or to assist with the operation of its QC system, such as broker and dealer monitoring systems to track personal financial interest from personnel. Resources from networks and third-party providers are also addressed in the standard outside of the resources component. For example, in the risk assessment process, the firm may identify quality risks associated with the use of networks and third-party providers. Also, in the monitoring and remediation process, the firm takes into account their use of networks and third party personal in determining monitoring activities. The information and communication component addresses the firm's processes for obtaining, generating, and using information to enable the design, implementation, and operation of the QC system and the performance of its engagements, and for communicating information within the firm and to external parties on a timely basis. The information and communication area of the firm's operations serves as a critical function for generating, gathering, gathering and disseminating the information needed for the firm, including the QC system, to function. The process of determining information needs is iterative and ongoing. As the nature and circumstances of change, information needs also change. This component includes a number of quality objectives that relate to the following areas identifying, capturing, processing, 
and maintaining information, the exchange of information, that information is communicated to us. This includes that the firm communicates firm level or level information with respect to the audit practice, firm personnel, or engagements to external parties. Such information is accurate and not misleading. And with respect to any such metrics that are communicated writing, the communication explains in reasonable detail how the metrics were determined, and if applicable, how the method of determining them changed since the metrics were last communicated. And information is communicated to or obtained from the network or and other participants. This component includes specified quality responses that are applicable to all firms and none that are applicable to only firms with larger PCAOB audit practices. They include communicate in writing its policies and procedures, communicate information related to the MR process to firm personnel, and communicate the result of the annual evaluation. For each of the six components inside the red circle, the standard specifies quality objectives. Each of the components, except for the engagement performance component, also includes the responses applicable to all firms. Additional governance and leadership component and the ethics and independence component include specified quality responses that are applicable to only firms with larger PCAOB audit practices. I will now turn to Scott to describe the MNR process. Thanks, Lynette. Okay, before we dive into monitoring and remediation, let's take another minute to realign with where we are in the structure of the firm's QC system. Recall this slide from earlier in the presentation. We've now discussed the first of two process components, i.e. the firm's risk assessment process, and all of the components that address the firm's organization and operation. And we're ready to talk about the second process component, which is the monitoring and remediation process. This graphic illustrates the steps of the monitoring and remediation process under QC1000. We'll briefly discuss each step of the process next, but before we go into that, I want to make an important overarching point and one that firms need to consider when designing their monitoring activities. That is, that under QC1000, individuals are required to remain objective when performing monitoring activities. Unlike the previous quality control standards, self-monitoring is not permitted within the firm's monitoring and remediation process. A required quality objective in the resources component states that individuals assigned to perform activities within the QC system have the competence, objectivity, and time to perform them. Consequently, individuals generally cannot perform monitoring activities over their own work because they would not be objective. Okay. Let's talk about designing and performing activities to monitor engagements and the firm's QC system, which is the first piece of our monitoring and remediation pie. QC 1000 includes requirements related to monitoring activities over completed engagements, in-process engagements, and engagements performed at a level below a substantial role. Some of these requirements vary based on the size of the firm. So first, starting at the top, all firms are required to perform monitoring activities over completed engagements. One element of this requirement is that firms inspect at least one completed engagement for each engagement partner over a cyclical period. Firms can choose any cyclical period that achieves their quality objectives, but can adopt a cycle longer than three years only if they are able to demonstrate how that cycle is adequate to provide a reasonable basis for detecting engagement deficiencies and QC deficiencies. QC 1000 also requires firms to incorporate a level of unpredictability in their selection and monitoring of completed engagements. Next, let's talk about in-process engagements. So firms with larger PCAOB audit practices are required to monitor in-process engagements. That is those firms that issued audit reports with respect to more than 100 issuers during the prior calendar year. And all other firms are required to consider doing so and may determine in light of their assessed quality risks that in-process monitoring is a necessary or appropriate part of their QC system. QC 1000 doesn't impose any specific requirements related to what constitutes in-process monitoring activities. So firms can design these activities as appropriate for their firm's particular facts and circumstances. Examples of in-process monitoring activities include 
in-flight reviews performed on a specific area of an engagement while the engagement is still in process, or evaluating an engagement team's progress against defined milestones or performance metrics. Last and similarly, all firms that participate at a level below a substantial role in another firm's engagements are required to consider performing monitoring activities over such work and determine whether it's appropriate to do so given the firm's particular facts and circumstances. There are factors in QC1000 that a firm is required to consider when determining the nature, timing, and extent of its engagement monitoring activities. These factors can be found in paragraph 64 of QC1000 with more information in the adopting release. QC1000 includes an optional scalability consideration meant to assist smaller firms in their design, implementation, and operation efforts for monitoring activities. In general, engagement monitoring activities are performed only on engagements as defined in the standard. It's basically any engagements performed under PCAOB standards. But some firms perform only a small number of engagements, and in the extreme case, a firm that only has one issuer engagement would have to monitor the same engagement every year. In order to address this, firms that issued engagement reports with respect to five or fewer engagements during the prior calendar year are allowed to include audits not performed under PCAOB auditing standards in their engagement monitoring activities. Okay, so next let's discuss QC system level monitoring activities, which are the second type of monitoring activities required by QC 1000. QC system level monitoring activities are directed at the performance of activities under the requirements of QC 1000. This includes the requirements relating to the six components that Lynette briefly covered earlier, as well as the firm's risk assessment process and the monitoring and remediation process itself. Similar to engagement monitoring activities, QC1000 includes factors in paragraph 65 that a firm is required to consider when determining the nature, timing, and extent of its QC system level monitoring activities. Many of these factors are similar between QC system level and the engagement monitoring activities. Now let's discuss the requirements for monitoring activities performed by a network for a second. So network monitoring activities may include, for example, monitoring the effectiveness of network resources or services that firms in the network are required to use in their QC system. If a network performs monitoring activities relating to the firm's QC system or the firm's engagements, QC 1000 includes three requirements. First, the firm requests, and if provided, evaluates information about monitoring activities performed, the results of those activities, and remedial actions the network has planned. Second, based on the information provided by the network, the firm determines its responsibilities in relation to the monitoring activities of the network and performs them. Such responsibilities include, to the extent appropriate, assisting with monitoring activities or responding to the results of the activities performed by the network. Third, the firm adjusts its monitoring activities as necessary based on the information it receives from the network. So there may be situations where a firm doesn't receive the information requested from the network. And if this is the case, the firm is not permitted to rely on the network's monitoring activities when planning and performing its own monitoring activities. Consider a scenario where a firm requests but does not receive any information from the network about monitoring activities it performs over the independent software application that the firm uses. In this situation, the firm is required to perform its own monitoring activities related to its QC system in that area. Otherwise, it has no basis for concluding that the quality objectives related to independence were achieved. One last very important point I wanna make about monitoring activities performed by a network is that regardless of what monitoring activities a network performs on behalf of a firm, the firm is ultimately responsible for its QC system. Next, let's talk about how to determine if engagement deficiencies exist and how to respond to them. So once again, during the next few slides, I'm going to introduce some new terms, which are highlighted in red font on the slide. These definitions can be found in Appendix A to QC 1000. 
and engagement deficiency as defined in paragraph A4 of Appendix A to QC1000 is an instance of noncompliance with APLR by the firm, firm personnel, or other participants with respect to an engagement of the firm or by the firm or firm personnel with respect to an engagement of another firm. An engagement deficiency could be an instance of noncompliance in which a firm didn't adequately support its opinion or didn't fulfill the objective of its role on the engagement or other instances of noncompliance with APLR with respect to a firm's engagement. Firms are required to evaluate various information when determining whether an engagement deficiency exists, including information about engagement and QC system level monitoring activities, information from monitoring activities performed by a network, if applicable, and other information. A firm's determination that an engagement deficiency exists may pertain to an in-process engagement, a completed engagement, or work performed on another firm's engagement. When engagement deficiency is identified, the action that the firm is required to take depends on which of the three buckets the deficiency falls into. So, actions to respond to engagement deficiencies related to in-process engagements is required to be taken as required by APLR to the extent necessary before the issuance of the related engagement report such that the report is appropriate in the circumstances. So consider an example where a firm identified an engagement deficiency on an in-process engagement because the engagement team didn't test the completeness and accuracy of information produced by the company that the team used to perform sub substantive procedures. In response to this deficiency, the engagement team is required to perform the required audit procedures before the auditor's report is issued. Action to respond to engagement deficiencies related to completed engagements is also required to be taken and is required by APLR, unless it is probable that the engagement reports are not being relied on. However, if it is not probable that the report is not being relied on, the firm is required to take action required by APLR. In this case, AS2901 and AS2905 as applicable. AS2901 addresses how to respond to an engagement deficiency identified after the issuance of the engagement report, and it was amended as part of the adoption of QC1000. More information can be found in the amended standard and in the QC adopting release. And finally, if a firm identifies an engagement deficiency on work it performed on another firm's engagement, it's required to communicate the deficiency to that other firm and to take any remedial action that the other firm determines is necessary to respond to the deficiency. And so the final point I'll make about engagement deficiencies is that firms are required to evaluate whether similar engagement deficiencies exist in other in-process engagements, completed engagements, and work performed on other firms' engagements. If similar engagement deficiencies are identified, QC1000 requires the firm to respond to these engagement deficiencies in the same manner as the firm would respond to any other engagement deficiency it may identify. Understanding the nature of the engagement deficiency will assist the firm in determining the extent of the necessary evaluation. To illustrate if the engagement deficiency was caused by an error in the firm's methodology for auditing a company's loan evaluation allowance, then the firm would evaluate whether similar engagement deficiencies exist on engagements that were also using that methodology. As another example, if engagement team members did not comply with PCAOB standards when auditing accounts receivable because they failed to perform certain procedures in the firm's audit program, the firm would evaluate whether the persons who were responsible for, for performing the procedures and the persons supervising the work participated in any other audit engagements accounts receivable testing, and if so, whether similar engagement deficiencies exist. So next up on our monitoring and remediation pie, we'll talk about how to determine if QC observations and QC deficiencies exist. Firms are required to timely evaluate certain information to determine whether QC observations exist, including information from monitoring activities, from oversight activities by regulators or other external inspections or reviews, 
or any other relevant information the firm becomes aware of. QC observations is a defined term in paragraph A9 of Appendix A. Basically, it is any information that may indicate a problem with the design, implementation, or operation of the firm's QC system is a QC observation. That includes all engagement deficiencies, as well as things like an error in the design or operation of a technology tool or methodology, or any other information that it suggests the firm may not have achieved a quality objective. All engagement deficiencies are QC observations, but as I'm going to explain next, not all QC observations are QC deficiencies. So once the firm identifies QC observations, it evaluates them to determine whether QC deficiencies exist. So firstly, QC deficiency is a defined term in paragraph A8 of Appendix A of QC 1000, and I'm not going to read through it, but at a high level, a QC deficiency is a QC observation or combination thereof that evidences either the firm hasn't achieved the reasonable assurance objective or one or more quality objectives, or it hasn't complied with the requirements of QC 1000. The determination of whether a QC deficiency exists is based on two factors. The first is the nature, severity, and pervasiveness of the matter that gave rise to the QC observation. And the second is the likelihood that the matter could affect other QC system components or other engagements, including in-process engagements and completed engagements, engagements to be, to be performed in the future, and work performed on other firms' engagements, and the severity of such an effect if it were to occur. The release on page 235 includes a graphic with examples of considerations relevant to determining QC deficiency. So next, let's talk about performing root cause analysis of QC deficiencies. And I wanna highlight four important points related to root cause analysis. The first is that firms are required to perform a root cause analysis of all QC deficiencies, which involves identifying and evaluating the causal factors that led to each QC deficiency by understanding what happened and why. The second, the firm may perform root cause analysis on QC deficiencies individually, or they may group similar QC deficiencies together. Next. The requirements for root cause analysis are flexible. The firm's approach can vary and procedures could take different forms depending on the circumstances, which allows for scalability. Some example procedures include a firm's approach to root cause analysis may include interviewing engagement team members and firm leadership, using proprietary tools to analyze large amounts of data and considering available performance metrics such as engagement hours, training records, audit milestones, or partner experience. Finally, if a firm belongs to a network and uses network resources or services, a root cause of a QC deficiency could be related to the network resource or service being provided, similar to a firm's use of resources or services provided by a third party provider, the firm is responsible for addressing the effect of the deficiency on its QC system, regardless of whether the remedial actions taken by the firm are coordinated with the network or designed and implemented exclusively by the firm. Further, the firm is responsible for determining whether the actions taken by the network sufficiently remediate the QC deficiency as it pertains to the firm's QC system. Finally, let's touch briefly on remedial actions. Firms are required to design and implement timely remedial actions to respond to QC deficiencies taking into account the results of the firm's root cause analysis and the nature, severity, and pervasiveness of the QC deficiency. I wanna highlight four factors related to de designing, implementing, and testing remedial actions. The timing of a firm's efforts to design and implement remedial actions depends on the results of the firm's root cause analysis and the nature, severity, and pervasiveness of the QC deficiency. So for example, where there is a high risk of severity or pervasiveness, remedial actions may have to be immediate to be considered timely. We expect the firm to respond in a way that would mitigate the occurrence of additional QC deficiencies related to similar underlying causes. 
In some circumstances, due to the extent of remedial actions necessary to address the QC deficiency, a firm might design and implement temporary remedial actions until permanent actions can be designed and implemented. For example, a firm might design and implement supplemental audit practice aids to address QC deficiencies until the firm is able to revise its comprehensive audit methodology. In some situations, the extent of remedial actions the firm needs to take to address a particular QC deficiency may be reduced by other compensating responses that the firm has in place. If the remedial actions, including any relevant comp compensating responses, have been tested and found effective in addressing the issue, the firm might determine based on the facts and circumstances that no further remedial action is necessary. Firms are also required to monitor the implementation and operating effectiveness of remedial actions to determine whether they were implemented as designed and operating effectively to remediate the QC deficiency. If not, the firm takes timely actions until their monitoring activities indicate that the QC deficiency was remediated. Timely actions could include, among other things, adjusting the implemented remedial actions, designing and implementing additional remedial actions, or performing additional root cause analysis to determine if other causes exist, and if so, designing and implementing remedial actions to address such causes. Once additional actions are taken, the firm continues monitoring activities until it determines that the QC deficiency has been remediated. Okay, before we move on again, let's just take another moment to realign with where we are on the structure of the firm's QC system. Again, let's take a look at this slide from earlier in the session. So we've now discussed both of the process components, the firm's risk assessment process and the monitoring and remediation process, and all of the components that address the firm's organization and operation. As we mentioned at the beginning of the session, the firm is also required to annually evaluate the effectiveness of the QC system and report to the PCAOB on that evaluation. So let's talk about that next. Now I'll turn to David to provide an overview of evaluation and reporting. Thanks, Guy. QC 1000 requires the firm to evaluate the effectiveness of its QC system based on the results of its monitoring activities and conclude as of September 30th of each year, referred to as the evaluation date, that its QC system either is effective with no unremediated QC deficiencies at all, is effective except for one or more unremediated QC deficiencies that are not major QC deficiencies, or is not effective, meaning one or more major QC deficiencies exist. The evaluation requirements of QC 1000 introduce a new term, major QC deficiency. Let's go over what that is next. A major QC deficiency as defined in paragraph A6 of Appendix A is an unremediated QC deficiency or combination of unremediated QC deficiencies that severely reduces the likelihood of the firm achieving the reasonable assurance objective or one or more quality objectives. And it's presumed to exist if the unremediated QC deficiency or combination either relates to the firm's governance and leadership that affect the overall environment supporting the operation of the QC system, or results in or is likely to result in one or more significant engagement deficiencies in engagements that, taken together, are significant in relation to the firm's total portfolio of engagements. A firm that is required to evaluate its QC system as of the evaluation date is also required to file a report on the results of the evaluation with the PCOB on Form QC no later than November 30th of the same year, referred to as the reporting date. As we discussed earlier during the applicability section of the session, even if a firm didn't perform any PCOB engagements during the reporting period, the firm may still have responsibilities with respect to past engagements, for example, related to document retention. In those cases, the firm is still required to evaluate its QC system and report the results of its evaluation on Form QC. It's only when the firm has no responsibilities under APLR with respect to engagements for the entire reporting period that it is no longer required to evaluate and report on its QC system. The required contents of the Form QC are included in paragraph 80 of the standard and discussed in the adopting release. 
Also, as a reminder, the individual with ultimate responsibility and accountability for the QC system as a whole, and the individual with operational responsibility and accountability for the QC system as a whole, are required to certify the firm's reports on Form QC to the PCAOB. This slide illustrates the timeline from the beginning of the period being evaluated through to the date the firm is required to report on the period being evaluated. Generally, the reporting period is October 1st through to September 30th of the following year. The firm then has 61 days to perform its evaluation and report the results on Form QC as the form is due on November 30th following the evaluation date. Note that for the first year of implementation, the reporting period will run from the date that the standard becomes effective, which is December 15th, 2025, through to September 30th, 2026. The last topic on our, on our agenda is documentation. QC1000 includes requirements for documenting the firm's QC system. Let's discuss those requirements now. The standard includes an overarching documentation requirement that captures the design, implementation, and operation of the firm's QC system, as well as the documentation requirements for specific matters, including lines of responsibility and supervision within the firm's QC system, information about the firm's risk assessment process and monitoring and remediation process and the results thereof, information about the basis for the conclusion reached on the firm's QC system, and documentation requirements for firms that belong to networks. The firm's documentation must be in sufficient detail to support a consistent understanding of the firm's QC system and enable an experienced auditor to understand its design, implementation, and operation. Firms are required to assemble their documentation for retention no later than December 14th. This is also referred to as the QC documentation completion date. This slide illustrates the entire QC cycle from the start of the QC reporting period to the QC documentation completion date. It also provides references to the applicable requirements in the standard. Finally, firms are re required to retain documentation related to the design, implementation, and operation of the QC system and of the annual evaluation of the QC system for seven years from the QC documentation completion date unless a longer period is required by law. This concludes today's presentation, providing an overview of the requirements of QC 1000. For more information on the standard and related amendments, please see PCAOB release number 2024-005 and visit the QC implementation page on the PCAOB's website, which we plan to update periodically with new implementation resources. Thank you for listening and have a great day.